All right, welcome back. Greetings everyone. Good morning from Indonesia. Good morning from Indo Anesthesia. And we are back at the week three of 19 Indo Anesthesia 2022. I am sure everyone is excited. I would like to remind all participants that you only need to register once for this event. Uh, you can uh, log in until the end of the symposium, which is next week. Selamat datang kepada seluruh peserta Indo Anesthesia yang ke-19. Uh, kepada seluruh peserta, diingatkan bahwa Anda cukup mendaftar satu kali, jadi boleh memakai link yang sama. Untuk teman-teman yang di Indonesia, seperti biasa, saya mau mengingatkan nanti ada tiga peserta yang beruntung untuk mendapatkan door prize dari Indo Anesthesia. Jadi terus ikuti acara Indo Anesthesia sampai nanti sore, rajin bertanya, nanti kita akan pilih random tiga pemenang yang beruntung. Oke, okay, so we will start the first session of the day. Uh, we will discuss discuss about regional anesthesia for this even we will for this session we will have three prominent speakers in this field uh, we will have uh, dr ali shariat from usa hello and dr jeff gatson also from usa and uh, Dr. Penafresia Kano from Philippines. Good evening for Ali and Jeff. And this uh, session will be led by Dr. Bestadi Sukmono or Dr. Mono, you can call him. Okay. Please, Dr. Mono. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you, Krisha, for the kind introductions. Hello, good morning from Indonesia. Good evening to all, to Ali and Dr. Jeff. And in, you're in New York and North Carolina. And good morning to Penn. How are you, Penn? And I hope everybody is doing fine amidst the pandemic. It's still going on strong, especially in Indonesia. And today I'm going to be your host. My name is Mono. I'm from Jakarta, Indonesia. Uh, I'll be your host in the uh, morning meeting, actually in actually in our country. Uh, the talk is about the topic is regional anesthesia. Uh, we're going to start with Dr. Ali Shariat, who is going to talk about uh, facial pain block in cardiac surgery and procedure and Dr. Ali uh, you can actually start your slide and the next uh, one is Dr. Jeff who is going to talk about the erector spine pain block the block is I don't know is going to be available uh, in this year and lastly Dr. Penn uh, from the Philippines who is going to talk about uh, abdominal analgesia and Dr. Ali, the time is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the for the wonderful introduction. And thank you to Dr. Susilo Chandra for, for giving me the honor of, of being here with you. Uh, I'm uh, Ali Sharad. I'm from New York. I practice in Mount Sinai Morningside and Mount Sinai West Hospitals. My topic is going to be fascial plane blocks for cardiac procedures. Uh, let me see. Uh, I have no disclosures to, to make. I'm just figuring out the uh, control of this. Uh, so I will begin by uh, briefly reviewing cardiac related pain. Uh, and I'll then go uh, and touch upon uh, neuraxial and paravertebral techniques and their relevance to, to modern practice. And I'll get into the heart of the talk which is fascial plane blocks uh, for cardiothoracic procedures involving sternotomy and also lateral thoracotomy, as well as uh, fascial plane blocks for ICD insertion. And I'll close with a few words about the future of blocks in enhanced recovery protocols for patients going for cardiac surgery. So when we talk about uh, cardiac related pain, pain related cardiac procedures, it's important to keep in mind that this is really uh, multifactorial. There are many etiologies uh, that can range from sternal wires to sternal retraction. Uh, IMA harvest is, is, can be very painful, obviously rib fractures, and even brachial plexus injury, particularly when uh, there is a fracture of a first rib with posterior displacement. So it's important to realize this when approaching the subject of acute pain following cardiac procedures in order that we may tailor our anesthetic specifically to the uh, etiology of pain. 
Now, regardless of the etiology, there is a chronic pain syndrome that is related to uh, sternotomy that is underappreciated and perhaps underreported. And by definition, this chronic post-sternotomy pain syndrome is a non-anginal pain lasting more than three months postoperatively. The incidence, depending on the source that you read, can range from 11 all the way to 56% at one year. This is a potentially uh, serious source of morbidity for patients going for cardiac surgery and underrecognized. Uh, one of the main risk factors is persistent acute pain in the immediate postoperative period requiring opioids. Therefore, treatment of pain in the immediate postoperative period can have large ramifications for patients in terms of their long-term prognosis for morbidity. Uh, although ketamine and pregabalin have been suggested to be of use uh, in this regard, evidence is really quite scant. Which brings us to the current interest in applying regional techniques to cardiac surgery. Really, regional anesthesia in cardiac surgery is nothing new. Anesthesiologists have been using epidural analgesia for cardiac surgery for many decades with excellent results. And there is a lot of data to show uh, the benefits of epidural analgesia. I'll just briefly touch upon it. Uh, for example, this study by Lehman colleagues uh, uh, studied uh, epidurals in patients going for coronary artery bypass graft. And patients that received the epidural were awake sooner, resumed spontaneous respiration earlier, and were extubated earlier than those that did not. In addition, patients who received a thoracic epidural had a lower incidence of tachycardia and MI than patients that did not receive epidurals. Moreover, there are many well-documented advantages of epidural analgesia beyond the obvious uh, superior analgesia. There is also sympathetic blockade, which particularly if the epidural is high enough to block the cardiac accelerator fibers, can increase subendocardial blood flow and improve myocardial oxygen supply. Also, uh, there are very definite pulmonary benefits, benefits with regard to pulmonary function uh, that have been very well documented. So the question is, why is this technique not routinely used in cardiac surgery? And of course, it comes down to the fear of neuraxial hematoma. But the question is, is this risk justified? It's interesting to note that there is only one single report of spinal hematoma in the context of cardiac surgery. And in this case, symptoms occurred 57 hours postoperatively. So temporally, it had nothing to do with the uh, very profound anticoagulation necessary for cardiopulmonary bypass. Uh, it was uh, preceded by starting IV heparinization uh, on the floor uh, and flushing a dysfunctional PICC line with alteplase. It was only then that blood appeared in the epidural catheter. Unfortunately, the, uh, the floor team pulled the catheter without informing uh, the anesthesia team. And it was then that the patient had symptoms. Uh, an MRI was ordered, which showed a spinal hematoma, which was uh, successfully decompressed, luckily. So this is really a very scary situation. And it is this fear that prevents us from utilizing this technique. But what is the risk, really, of spinal hematoma? Uh, when uh, providing a cardiac patient with an epidural. Ho and colleagues figured out 
that it was between one in 150,000, which is the risk of hematoma in a patient going for non-cardiac surgery, all the way up to one in 1,500, which was figured out by a, an algorithm uh, for a, an event that has yet to take place. The reality is that these numbers are probably rather conservative. The risk is probably a good deal lower, but for most practitioners, the risk of even one case occurring in an otherwise routine cardiac surgery is one too many. And it is the fear of this complication that restricts the accumulation of experience and data. And that brings us to the power vertebral block. Well, the power vertebral block, as we know, has a far better safety profile. There has not been a single case report implicating power vertebral block to a spinal hematoma. And in fact, the power vertebral block has been studied quite uh, extensively for patients going for cardiac surgery, particularly minimally invasive cardiac surgery through an anterior thoracotomy, uh, such as this study by Dolan colleagues in which patients going for minimally invasive cardiac surgery were randomized to receive either a paravertebral catheter or a thoracic epidural catheter. And they found that the paravertebral catheter was equivalent to the epidural in providing uh, post-operative pain control, and the advantage was given to the paravertebral catheter due to the better safety profile. So why not use the power vertebral block for cardiac procedures routinely? Well, first and foremost, it's a unilateral block, right? So it's most useful for surgeries that are involving one side of the, the chest, obviously. It's an advanced procedure. Not all anesthesiologists are comfortable performing it. It requires positioning prior to uh, the case. And finally, it's a deep block. It's in a non-compressible space. Therefore, there are similar concerns with regard to anticoagulation as with epidural analgesia. And as our guidelines have stated in the past that for patients undergoing deep plexus or peripheral block, we recommend that recommendations regarding neuraxial techniques be similarly applied despite the lack of evidence right? There is always that theoretical risk. No one wants to be the first person to report this. And there may be medical legal ramifications, even if one is the first to, to report it. Nevertheless, the bilateral paravertebral catheters have been studied in the context of cardiac surgery via sternotomy. Uh, in this study by Ho and colleagues, this is Dr. Karmakar's group in Hong Kong. And strangely enough, this technique did not entirely eliminate the need for postoperative opioids, perhaps because the lower cervical dermatomes were not uh, targeted by this technique. More importantly, uh, all patients in this study had post-operative mental status changes consistent with local anesthetic toxicity, and the study was terminated after only seven patients. This despite the fact that the ropivacaine dose was less than the recommended toxic dose, right? So we run into problems that are unexpected with regard to local anesthetic systemic absorption when we use this bilateral paravertebral catheter technique. And that brings us to the fascial plane blocks and the intense interest in recent years uh, around them, particularly applied to cardiac surgery and sternotomy. There are a few inherent benefits to fascial plane blocks. One is that there is an increased distance between the needle and the neurovascular structures, thereby reducing the risk of damage to these delicate structures. 
There is also less of a potential for autonomic blockade and hemodynamic compromise in patients who can ill afford it. And finally, there is an avoidance of the very feared neuraxial complications that we spoke of. Now, there are two blocks that have been recently described that specifically target the, uh, the innervation of the sternum. They are the pecto-intercostal fascial plane block, or PIF block, and the transversus thoracis plane block, or TTP block. They both target the terminal branches of the uh, anterior cutaneous branch, I should say, of the intercostal nerves from T1 through T6, right? These are the branches that innervate the sternum. And uh, they're performed immediately adjacent to the sternum with the PIF block. Local anesthetic is deposited between the pectoralis major and internal intercostal muscles. Uh, usually in our experience, one injection is enough to spread from T2 through T6. T1 is, is sometimes not always anesthetized. Uh, and here is an ultrasound image of the needle traversing from right to left. Again, local anesthetic is injected between the pectoralis major and the internal intercostal muscle. Usually we perform this block between rib three and four or rib four and five. The TTP block is in a slightly deeper plane. It's performed between the internal intercostal muscle and the transversus thoracis muscle, which lies directly superficial to the pleura. So there is theoretically an increased risk of pleural puncture due to the fact that it's slightly deeper. Also, I want to point out that the internal thoracic vein and artery also run through this space and therefore vascular injection, intravascular injection and vascular puncture uh, also represents uh, a risk in this block. And here is a picture from one of our uh, studies. Uh, the arrow shows where the block is performed between the internal intercostal muscle and transversus thoracis muscle. Uh, this transversus thoracis muscle is a little bit more prominent than you'll usually see in most patients. Usually it's a very thin hypoechoic band directly superficial to the pleura. It sometimes takes practice in scanning to realize that that is actually a muscle. And here is another picture from, from one of our, our reports of the injection taking place um, between ribs three and rib four. And the, both the PIF block and the TTP block have been successfully reported in patients undergoing sternotomy. Here, Liu and colleagues reported the successful use of the PIF block for a patient suffering from acute post-sternotomy pain. There, this, in this report, it was used as a rescue block. And in this uh, pilot study by Fuji and colleagues, Patients were randomized to receive either TTP block or no block when they were going for open cardiac surgery. And in the first 12 hours post extubation, patients who received the TTP block had significantly lower pain scores than those that did not. I'd also just like to point out this cadaveric report by Fuji, in which local, uh, in which dye was injected in a cadaver bilaterally. Now, on the right side, you have the spread that you would expect from a TTP block that is performed at one level. That is, that dye is spreading from T2 through T5. On the left side, an internal mammary artery harvest had been performed. And here, the dye is restricted to one level, right, at the point of injection. So it's important to keep in mind for patients going for reop who have had an IMA harvest, the spread may not be what you would expect. It may be a limited spread due to the deformation of the tissue planes. 
Moving on, do the PEX blocks have a role in cardiac surgery? Well, this was a, an excellent case report by uh, Dr. Jeff Gapston's group down at Duke University of uh, a man who was going for minimally invasive mitral valve replacement through an anterior thoracotomy. The patient had intractable uh, pain postoperatively that resulted in splinting and shallow breathing. Uh, the patient then required supplemental oxygen and a prolonged ICU stay. Uh, the team performed a PEX-2 block uh, with complete resolution of the pain. Uh, the patient then was able to take deep breaths, was weaned off the oxygen, and was able to be discharged from the ICU. So this was a very excellent uh, example of a successful use of a fascial plane block for cardiac surgery. And here is a picture of the incisions uh, that were so successfully treated by a PEX-2 block. Furthermore, Koshal and colleagues randomized pediatric patients going for minimally invasive cardiac surgery uh, through an anterior thoracotomy to receive either straightest anterior plane block, the uh, PEX-2 block, or multiple intercostal blocks. And they found that the patient for the first four hours post-extubation had very similar pain scores. After the fourth hour post-extubation, the patients who received the fascial plane blocks had significantly lower pain scores than those who received the intercostal blocks, right? As we know, this is, this is something that we would expect, right? Because uh, with an intercostal block, as we know, there is very high rate of systemic local anesthetic absorption, and therefore this limits the duration of action of the intercostal block. So this represents a further benefit of fascial plane blocks. PEX blocks have also been studied in the context of uh, cardiac surgery via a midline sternotomy. Here, Kumar and colleagues randomized patients to receive either a PEX-2 block bilaterally, one shot, or no block. And they found that the, for the PEX-2 block, the time to extubation was significantly lower and the pain scores were significantly lower. Unfortunately, uh, they did not discuss what aspect of post pain was addressed by the PEX-2 block, right? As we discussed earlier, uh, pain after a sternotomy is multifactorial. The problem with many uh, studies involving fascial plane blocks uh, in any context is that uh, sensory exams are not performed, possibly due to the fact that these blocks are, are occasionally performed after the patients are under general anesthesia or, or shortly before. And so very often we don't get a sense of uh, exactly what aspect of the pain is being treated by these blocks. Which brings us to the erector spiny block, the ESP block. Now, I just want to point out this is a picture of the sensory distribution of the ESP block in the original description of Ferrero and colleagues. And it's noteworthy that that sensory distribution stops in the anterior thorax at the midclavicular line, right? Therefore, there is sternal sparing with this block, even in this description that showed most of the hemithorax um, affected by the block. This is another picture from the same uh, study from Ferrero and colleagues. And you can see uh, there is sternal sparing. So it's something to keep in mind when we take a look at any study that, that uh, examines the role of ESP uh, in sternotomy. Furthermore, I would just like to quickly point out that there has been a recent uh, volunteer study by Zhang and colleagues that failed to show a sensory distribution past the posterior thorax, right? Not even to the lateral or anterior thorax. So we have to keep in mind 
that the mechanism of action and reproducibility of this block are being questioned at this moment. Despite all this, the uh, ESP block has been studied in the context of sternotomy. Uh, this is one of the early studies by Krishna and colleagues in which uh, patients going for cardiac surgery were randomized to receive either a bilateral one-shot ESP block or no block. And they found that the patients who received the ESP blocks had a shorter time to extubation, lower opioid usage, and less length of time in the ICU. Uh, this was followed by a study by Philippe Macaire and colleagues in which they compared patients going for cardiac surgery who received bilateral ESP catheters with historical controls who did not receive any block. And they found that the patients who received the ESP catheters had lower total morphine consumption uh, in the first 48 hours. Furthermore, it seems that the ESP block has a very favorable uh, risk profile with respect to anticoagulation. Uh, this is a case series by Adhikari and colleagues of patients, excuse me, who went, uh, who, who received a left ventricular assist device implantation and had intractable pain. And five of these patients received a continuous ESP catheter and no complications were observed either during catheter insertion or removal despite therapeutic anticoagulation. So for now, it seems to have an excellent safety profile. Finally, I'm going to say a few words about fascial pain blocks for subcutaneous ICD placements. Uh, the subcutaneous ICD is really a, a kind of a newer uh, way to place an ICD that eliminates the potential for vascular injury because it leaves the heart and vasculature untouched. For those of you who are unfamiliar, the device is implanted in the mid axillary line and the lead is tunneled across the thorax and up the uh, sternal border. Up, and, and that tunneling on the left sternal border is especially painful and stimulating. And in the past has necessitated deep levels of sedation with use of opioid uh, or even general anesthesia as was the norm in our own institution. And we, uh, a few years ago, we started thinking about uh, applying these novel fascial plane blocks to this procedure. And we decided to combine a serratus anterior plane block which we theorized would, would anesthetize the implantation of the device with a TTP block, which we hoped would take care of the tunneling of the uh, lead up the sternal border. Several other teams had this idea almost at the same time, and we kind of published all at the same time. Uh, this is our report uh, of, of our first successful application of this technique of the TTT block and the anterior serratus block. We were still using general anesthesia due to the fact that this was our institutional standard. Uh, however, we found that no intraoperative fentanyl was necessary post-induction. So we followed this case report by a small uh, prospective trial uh, in which we randomized patients to receiving either the serratus anterior plane block and TTT blocks or no block. And the patients who received the fascial plane blocks had significantly lower uh, opioid requirements uh, during the procedure. So what is the future of regional anesthesia in cardiac procedures? We're practicing in an era where we are trying to find opioid sparing methods. And we're trying to fast track patients so that they can be uh, weaned off of a mechanical ventilation sooner and be discharged from the ICU sooner. And this requires a multidisciplinary approach using multimodal techniques of analgesia. And really regional anesthesia is at the core of these multimodal uh, methods. And these techniques are 
little by little finding their way into enhanced recovery protocols for cardiac patients. So it's a very exciting time for us. So in conclusion, we spoke about the multifactorial nature of postoperative pain for cardiac surgery. I touched upon uh, neuraxial techniques and paravertebral blocks and their use in cardiac procedures. These techniques have a higher risk profile and therefore they have fallen out of favor in the context of cardiac surgery. Uh, fascial plane blocks uh, may have a place as both adjunct pain techniques and even as sole anesthetics, for example, in the case of ICD implantation. We must keep in mind that these are newer techniques. Uh, in some cases, the mechanism of action has not been entirely elucidated, as in the case of ESP box. However, these, these novel techniques are finding their place in enhanced recovery protocols for cardiac patients. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, thank you very much for your very interesting topic and the peace there's a future in visual anesthesia in cardiac surgery and with further studies I think we can apply uh, both the special techniques and the fact for the PPP block. And our center is actually uh, doing the study on PPP block. We're going to publish it very soon. Mono, your sound is not good. Oh, okay. Sorry, Doc. <laughs> okay. Uh, we're moving on to the next participant. Uh, as next speaker, Dr. Uh, Jeff. Uh, we're going to talk about... He's going to talk about uh, the erector spine. And Dr. Jeff. Uh, you can start your slide. Okay. Okay. Can you see? Can you see it? Is it okay? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Well, thanks, Mono, and thank you, um, Cecilo, and the um, and the whole Indonesian uh, community in anesthesia for inviting me um, to be part of this. It's it's really an honor and a pleasure. It's been, gosh, I think a decade since I was uh, in Jakarta um, for Indian anesthesia. So it's uh, good to be part of it. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, what I wanna talk about in the next uh, 25 minutes or so is, is gonna build on what um, Dr. Shariat has, has um, teased us a little bit with, and that's the erector spinae plane block um, and striking the balance between enthusiasm for this block and what evidence we do have to date to show that it works. And it's, it's a bit of a controversial topic because there are lots and lots of favorable comments about a right responding plane block. If, you, if you're doing these things, this is what my residents say. If you're doing these things or, or a, you've played with the right responding plane block, you may share some of that enthusiasm or you might not because there is a growing sense in social media and conferences. And when I talk to people that maybe the initial enthusiasm for this block that it could do everything for us um, may not be quite as um, quite validated. So let's take a look. So if, you, if you're not familiar with this block, this is a block that is done um, next to the spine. It's like a pair of vertebral, except it's done just behind the transverse process. And you can see the transverse processes there on the right side of the spine. They've peeled away the erector spinae plane, uh, erector spinae muscle. And the idea is the local spreads up and down. Here's a different view. So here's a transverse view. And you can see the, the, the transverse processes here. Needle comes in, touches the transit process, and layers out local between the erector spinae muscle there in pink and the transit process. And in the course of doing this, it definitely gets the dorsal ramus, that's the one coming um, towards the bottom of the screen, innervating the back and the paraspinal muscles and the 
periosteum of the vertebra. Um, but the, the thought is that this actually allows local to sneak in front of the transition process and in effect, get us a paravertebral block without all the risk of paravertebral blocks. So Dr. Shariat explained um, how great paravertebral block is. Um, and this is maybe, but I think one of the reasons that it's not done in a lot of centers is it's kind of a scary block. You're putting a needle right next to the pleura. And so this is maybe a way to get all the benefits of a paravertebral without the risks. And um, this is a, a simplified version of what you can expect in terms of the sensory uh, or the analgesic component. If you do it at T10, you get a lot of the abdominal branches of the spinal nerves. If you do it at T5, you get the, the thoracic. And then uh, we've been doing a lot of rectus spiny plane blocks in the lumbar region for lumbar spine surgery. And I'll talk more about, um, about that. But wait, there's more. You can find a case report for erector spinae plane block giving you analgesia for all kinds of things. Neck surgery, headaches, herpes zoster, cesarean section, hip fracture, femur fracture, shoulder arthroscopy, gender reassignment surgery. So it's not just for the thorax and the abdomen and the lumbar spine, at least if you, if you read these case reports. And, and so there, in the beginning, when this first came out, we thought, oh my gosh, this is a block that can do everything from the chin right down to the groin. How amazing. And certainly if you look at the, yeah, the publications over the last several years, and I've stopped this at 2020, but you, you can imagine this has kept going, it's skyrocketed. So they're now over uh, nearly a thousand independent publications on PubMed when you um, look at erector spinae plane block. Now, only about 7% of these are randomized controlled trials, all right? The rest, the vast majority, 93% are case reports and case series, and that's okay. That's how things happen when a block first gets introduced. People rush to see, hey, I wonder if I can do it for this or that, and that's how these case reports and series get published. So let's take a look at um, the, the randomized controlled trials. Uh, of those 55, most were in thoracic. Uh, second best was, or a second largest group was breast surgery. There was a good chunk of laparoscopy and then some spine and cardiac pediatrics and then some other things. If we look at the, just the adult and ignore the peds side and we consider what volume of local anesthetic are people using, it seems like there is a variety. Um, most people are doing, using 20 in these reports, some 25 some 30 mils, not too many using less than 20. Now, 60% of those randomized control trials were against placebo or sham blocks, and they were mostly positive. And you, you would hope that a block done with local anesthetic against placebo would give you a positive result. Not all did though. Um, the ones that went were against comparators, the other 40% were against things like serratus plain block, tap block, intrathecal morphine, um, and paravertebral. And I won't go into all the studies, but I'll, I'll, I'll save you the time and I'll summarize two, two points from these 55 randomized control studies. ESP is probably better than nothing in producing early. And by early, I mean in the first 24 hour pain scores and or opioid consumption. So that's good. Number two, ESP doesn't do so well against paratebral or thoracic epidural. And I, um, I, I suspect that Dr. Shariat would agree with me that a well done paravertebral or well done thoracic epidural for chest surgery is pretty hard to beat. And so it's a pretty high bar. So I'm not too surprised that ESP fails against that. So then given these results, why is it so popular? Um, and I think I have an explanation for it. Here's my suspicion. Number one, it's versatile. So you can do, as we as outlined before, an ESP block in the thoracic region. 
abdominal region, lumbar spine. And then you saw these other case reports. People are doing cervical ES. We're doing cervical ESPs now for cervical spine surgery. So you can do it at multiple different spots. It is safe. So compared to a, um, a neuraxial technique in a patient that's got uh, that's anticoagulated, it's certainly safer um, and poses less of a risk. Um, and so, and because it's fairly shallow, you're not going as deep as a paravertebral. Uh, again, I think there's less room to run into to trouble. And it's simple. So this block, as we'll say, as we'll, I'll show you in a second, involves putting a needle down and hitting a bone. And if you hitting a bone in regional anesthesia, that's a really discreet, simple endpoint. You hit the bone, you inject, you're done. And so I think those three things, the versatility, the safety, and the simplicity have helped to um, make this a very popular block. And we do see that the vast majority of those 93% of all the publications were overwhelmingly positive reports. Now, there could be some bias there. People tend not to publish the case reports that didn't go so well or the block failed. However, this is, this is promising. There's so many positive reports. All right, well, let's look just briefly at the technical aspects of this block. So this is how we do the block. The probe is in the parasagal position. This is a thoracic example. And the needle comes, um, in this case, from above, but you can do it either way. I'll usually start with the probe off the side and so I can see the ribs and then I'll slide the probe in till I just catch the transverse processes. And then you can bring a needle in either from below or from above and you're gonna hit the transverse process. And here's a little video. So you can see that the pink represents the erector spiny muscle. You can see the transverse process there, the, the bright hyperechoic rim of the transverse process with the shadow behind it. And our needle's gonna come in from the right-hand side. Uh, so here's our video and you can see, now I'm gonna, as we begin to inject, you can see the muscle begins to lift, lift off that transverse process. And it takes, it takes a bit of hydraulic pressure to do this on the very first injection. But you'll see over time as we put a little more local anesthetic in there, here we go. Now it's spreading left and right and really elevating that muscle off the bone. So that's a, that's a good endpoint there. You can see a nice dark strip of local anesthetic beneath the muscle. And that's, that's what we're looking for at the, end of the, at the end of injection. That's satisfying. Okay, we could. So it looks pretty easy, right? Well, there are some complicating factors. And the first complicating factor is the clinical effect might not match the theory. And I'll explain that in a second. And number two, ESP can sometimes be a little trickier than it's made to appear, certainly than I've just made it to appear in that last video. And I'll explain both of those things. Here's the thing that confused us and still, still confuses us a lot with this block. You can do the block and get a beautiful appearance on the ultrasound screen. And then the patient says, no, I still feel everything. I don't have any lack of sensation on my chest or on my abdomen. And yet they feel better. And that's a real paradox of this block. Um, this is an example of a volunteer study which showed that they did not get much of a sensory change in the side, the lateral or the anterior part of the chest, but they did get consistent sensory change in the back as you can see here. Um, now, that, that territory corresponds with the dorsal ramus. So remember, when you're putting that needle in the, vent, the dorsal part of the transverse process, that little nerve that comes up to the surface, that's the dorsal ramus. So I would definitely expect to see this result. And so this suggests to me that maybe the local isn't, isn't in fact getting to the front of the transverse process like we thought it was supposed to. And um, Ali had already uh, shown you this, so I won't belabor this. This is the Zhang paper, again, another volunteer study, and they found pretty much exactly the same thing. The shapes differed in volunteer to volunteer, but in general, not a whole lot of spread past the uh, posterior axillary line around to the lateral and anterior part of the, part of the thorax. And that was the 20 mils of half percent lepivacaine. We look at cadaver studies and we see the same thing in most of them. So you can see here in the middle part that all that contrast stays behind the transverse process. 
When they dissected it on the far right-hand side, you can see the ventral ramus doesn't have any dye. So in the cadaver model, most cadaver models that, you'll, that we'll look at in the literature, it spares the ventral ramus, which explains why in those volunteer studies, we don't have any sensory block in the front. But then there's this. There are multiple reports of erector spiny plane block providing visceral coverage for surgery, which means that the local has to be getting to the sympathetic chain and therefore in front of the transverse process somehow. So how does that work? It's making my head work, head hurt to think about this. We seem to be only getting spread to the dorsal ramus, but at the same time, we're getting excellent pain relief for surgery on the anterior part of the, of the trunk. And I wonder, are we thinking about this the wrong way? In other words, do we need to have a sensory block on the front of the trunk? And which has led a lot of people to wonder, is there or are there alternative mechanisms to why the ESP block works? And I, also, I think the answer probably is yes, and I'll suggest um, a couple. People have thought that maybe it's a systemic local anesthetic effect. In other words, if you just put enough local anesthetic in somebody's body, irrespective of where it is, you'll get a plasma level and that makes people feel better. I'm not so sure about that. I, I, I think that it does more than just, than just that systemic effect. There's also a thought that the, the fascia, the lining of those muscles and the, and the fascial planes is richly innervated with nociceptors. And by just blocking the fascia of the posterior trunk, you make people feel better and they have an, there's an analgesic effect from that itself. That's interesting and it it's, hasn't been tested yet. It's just a theory at this point. And then there's a thought that maybe there is in fact enough spread to the anterior part of the um, transverse process, but there's just not enough to cause a sensory block. There is enough to cause a sympathetic block. And I think personally, this is where the money is. And here, here's what I mean by that. So, you know, when we do a spinal in a patient, there's a, a heavy concentration down in the lumbar area where we do the, where the local anesthetics put. And you, it's so concentrated that we get the sympathetic fibers, the sensory fibers and the motor fibers. So that's all the dark pink. And then as you go up the, the neuraxis, as the concentration gradient falls away, at some point the motor fibers come back and you're left with sympathetic and sensory. And then the same thing happens. As you go farther up, the sensory fibers come back. There's not enough concentration there to block sensory fibers. And all you're getting are little fine sympathetic fibers. And I suspect personally that this is what's happening with the erector spinal plane block. We put the logo behind the transverse process and most of it's right there. And that's why we get a really good block of the back. But there is a spread to the, to the ventral ramus, just not enough to cause a motor or sensory block, but enough to cause a sympathetic block. And that makes people feel better. So that's, that's a theory that, that um, to date hasn't been tested, but stay tuned because we are planning on testing this. We're, we're using um, thermal imaging uh, in a study here to, to test this out. So we'll do pre-block, we'll take a thermal image of the patient's trunk and you can see that there's a, a temperature um, associated with, uh, with different parts of the, 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 the surface anatomy. Um, here, post-block, it looks the same colors, but the mean temperature has changed. So you, this is an epidural, this is not an ESP. But you can see that, that sympathectomy, which is kind of hard to, to test for with a, a needle or ice, you can see a temperature change. And so we're planning on testing that. So, so stay tuned um, uh, for those results. Um, okay, so that's the, that's the clinical effect it may not match the theory. Now, the second point that complicates how we think about erector spiny plane block is, can be, it can be trickier than it's made to appear. Here's a still image of the beginning of that block. And you can see the transverse process in the middle of the screen. You can see the needle coming down and it's deliberately hitting the corner of that transverse process. And that's because we failed a lot of times early on. We would 
the original description had the needle coming down and hitting the top of the transit process right in the middle. And we did it and we saw some spread of local anesthetic and we high-fived each other and thought we did a great job. And then the patient didn't feel very good afterwards. And we realized um, something wasn't, wasn't adding up. And I, I had my colleague do an ESP block on me to see if what was going on. And I had the same result. I had a dinner plate size numb section of my back, but nothing in the front. We went back and looked at the video clips and we realized that what we were doing was an intramuscular injection. The muscle can be quite sticky to the transverse process. And so what we've learned to do is to bring the needle down and touch the corner of the transverse to process to make sure that we're truly underneath that underside of the muscle. And hitting the corner allows us to, to get underneath and truly peel that muscle off. So that's a little technical tip that we learned through trial and error. And once we started fixing that and doing it this way, our results got a lot better. There are still questions that are, um, that are outstanding. What volume relates to what kind of spread um, up, and down the, up and down the paraspinal area? And do you do one or two injections? Well, we tested this out in, in some cadavers um, using dye and contrast and fluoroscopy and then dissected them to look at what happened. And what we found over a number of different injections in a number of different areas were, were two things. There is a pretty predictable relationship between volume and levels. And what we kind of figured out is if you use 30 mils, you can probably expect to get about eight levels in the thorax. The other thing we found was if you, if you do use um, enough volume, you can, you can reach um, much more, much, much a, a higher um, band of anesthesia. So you can get up to 10, 11, or 12 levels. So you may wish to do one injection in the middle uh, versus two injections, um, uh, separate injections, just for ease sake. So, uh, and what we found as well in the cadavers, there again was no obvious stain that we could see of the, of the ventral rami. Now that's in the thorax and the lumbar ESP is a little bit of a different story. The muscle there is thicker, it's less compliant and it's a little bit more challenging to see with ultrasound. But we did the same experiment with the lumbar. And again, found a, a consistent level, a consistent relationship, sorry. Uh, 10 mils gave you two levels, 20 mils, three levels, 30 mils gives you four levels. Um, and again, we didn't see any spread to the ventral rami or the epidural space, which was important because we were thinking of doing this for, um, for lumbar spine surgery. And we wanted to make sure we weren't gonna end up giving the patient an inadvertent epidural block that would then interfere with neuromonitoring or um, you know, have them wake up and both legs can't move, which would be a, a, a bad outcome. Anyway, this is the sort of the, what we ended up coming up with as a simple recipe. So for all of our ESPs, I use 30 mils. In the thorax, it gets me eight levels or so. In the lumbar region, less compliant, less spread, about four levels, which is about ex acceptable for most of our three or four level um, decompressions and fusion surgeries. So a, a question that has begun to been asked at meetings and on social media is, do we need the ESP? If there's such controversy about how it works, do, is this a valuable block to have, to be teaching people? I personally think the answer is yes. Um, and I think some others would agree with me. And, and this is a, a really thoughtful article that came out in the Anesthesia Journal from the UK um, in, I think, in late 2020. Uh, and the, the idea here was they were saying, look, we have 50 blocks that we can teach people. And is it worth teaching all 50 to everybody? Or should we just stick with plan A basic blocks for 90% of our learners? And sure, there's gonna be the experts that need the, the advanced, fancy, exotic blocks. Uh, and, I, and I think that, that concept rings true to me. And the, I'll just point out that for the chest wall, they did recommend the erector spinae plane block. So what do we know from the evidence? We know that ESP is easy and it's safe. 
I think personally, and this is my opinion, that the best use case is in spine. Because remember, if you're going to get anything out of an ESP block, you get the dorsal ramus. And that is 90% of what you need for spine surgery. Our spine patients wake up and they, they feel amazing. They feel so much better than our typical spine wake up in the recovery room, which is they go from being nearly unconscious to 10 out of 10 pain. Um, and so this ESP block has really softened the landing for those patients and they, their first day is much different. And we're starting to see a lot more evidence come out in the, in the literature looking specifically at spine. I think the next best use case is thoracic. I think for some reason, it just does a, a better job getting to that ventral ramus and or the sympathetic chain. And the patients that get ESP blocks for thoracic surgery seem to do better than the ones where I've used it for abdominal surgery. Um, and, and I think this sentence sort of sums up um, where a lot of us are at. We're now at a point where we need to spend less effort on celebrating unique applications and weirdo case reports, and instead focus on rigorously clarifying how this block actually works um, so that we can apply it more consistently in our practice. So, um, so less, you know, less uh, case reports and more um, randomized controlled trials against other things and more um, looking at how this, how this block actually works. We need randomized controlled trials against active comparators. Remember most of those RCTs were against sham blocks. Now I really wanna know how does ESP stack up against an epidural? How does it stack up against paravertebral? And we're beginning to see those, those studies come through. We need to see better outcomes. And this is true of all block studies and pain studies. I am less interested if there's a two point difference on the pain scale in the first 24 hours. I'm more interested in how we can spare opioid consumption in the first 24 hours. But ultimately I think what we need are, are how does this block affect the quality of recovery? How does it affect the patient reported outcome measures or other scales of, of global recovery? Um, those are, I think are some, some great things to tackle in the future. Again, the mechanism is not totally clear. And, I, and we've, we've done a lot of cadaver work um, in, in the past few years. I'd love to see more mechanistic investigation in non cadaveric volunteer and surgical models. Then Dr. Shariat talked a bit about um, catheters. And I think this is a, we've used a lot of catheters in the erector spinae plane. And, and there are, I'll share with you that we've had mixed results at times. There, there seems to be um, the need for an intermittent bolus function that re-expands that space and, and creates and keep block going rather than just a just a little trickle of local aesthetic that goes in at 10 mils an hour. But those questions have again have not been rigorously tested. And then education to address some of these technical aspects that um, that seem to be at, at work here. Um, if you haven't done an ESP and you want to learn how to do it, here's a, a little video that we put out. There's a QR code for you to, um, to scan if you wish. Um, and I'll be happy to take questions at the end of the, the session after Dr. Kano has, uh, has done her part. So thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Thank you very much, Dr. Katz. It is actually a very controversial topic uh, talks. I know we've been doing a lot of ESPs in our practice and we don't do as much uh, ESP because of all the things that you said that most patients wake up with uh, not feeling very uh, happy uh, mm. despite the, the good parameters in their uh, the, the low heart rates, the good blood pressures, but they don't feel uh, comfortable. So we don't do as much as we do back in those two years. And we'd like to thank you for the 500 plus participants who are joining us this morning in Jakarta, Indonesia, and probably all over the world. Uh, there are more than 500 people on air today.
listening to both of your talks. And last but not least, this is my good friend, Dr. Penafancio. Hi, Pen. How are you? <laughs> I see that you have started your slide. <laughs> Hello, Mono. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice to see you. <laughs> yeah, nice to see you again. Yes, and nice she's going... <laughs> yes, it's been so long not to see you again. And she's going to talk about updates of analgesia for abdominal surgery. And and for Dr. Gasset and Dr. Shariat, you can uh, start reading the Q&A box uh, in the below. And for Pen, the time is yours. Thank you. Okay, good morning, everyone. I would like to thank Dr. Susilo for inviting me here, including the organizing committee and also Mono. It's indeed a great pleasure to be back again. Now, my talk is about updates for abdominal surgery on analgesia. Now, we know that the abdominal wall is composed of four pairs of muscles. We have the vertical rectus abdominis and the three flat muscles namely from superficial up to the bottom, we have the external oblique, the internal oblique, and the transversus abdominis muscle. And it is at the transversus abdominis plane, which is between the internal oblique and the transversus abdominis, where the thoracoabdominal nerves, namely from T6 up to L1, would pass. Now, initially, these thoracoabdominal nerves, as we know, would pass between the innermost and internal intercostal muscle. And then after which it would enter the top plane to become the anterior branch, after which the nerve would enter and penetrate the rectus sheath and then the rectus abdominis muscle to become the anterior cutaneous branch, which provides innervation to the anterior abdominal wall from the midline up to the mid-clavicular line. Now, the T6 to T9 nerves would enter the top at the level of the costal margin, medial to the mid-clavicular line, while the T6 enters the top just lateral to the linea alba, while the T10 to the T11 would enter the top at the anterior axillary line. On the other hand, the lateral cutaneous branch would enter and separate from this nerve, would enter the posterior portion of the mid-axillary line. So it enters just posterior to the mid-axillary line, after which it would ascend and then ascends as far as up to the anterior axillary line. It innervates the skin of the lateral abdominal wall up to the mid-clavicular line between the costal margin and the iliac crest. If you would look at this image, just as a review, you will be able to see the T6 to T9 nerves entering the top plane at the mid-clavicular line. The T6 would enter just lateral to the linea alba. Now, we should be reminded that the T12 or the subcostal nerve before entering the top plane will first pass along the quadratus lumborum muscle. Now, there are communications between the thoracoabdominal nerves from T6 to T12, including the iliunguinal and the iliohypogastric nerve from L1, such that there will be an upper top plexus and then a lower top plexus. Now, you can see from this cadaveric dissection, there are several interconnections. In fact, there is a massive anastomosis of the nerves of the so rock abdominal, lateral cutaneous, and the anterior cutaneous nerves. This is perhaps the reason why you develop so much pain if you undergo an abdominal surgery. Now, the first thing that it has brought to our mind before, if ever we are going to undergo abdominal surgery, the gold standard has always been to have an epidural or post of analgesia. But at the present times, because of the emergence of the fast-track rehabilitation strategies, 
including the adoption of the minimally invasive surgeries. And the newer meta-analysis which show less impressive outcome results on postoperative morbidity and mortality of epidurals compared to general anesthesia, including the widespread use of the anticoagulants which hinders the use of the epidural and the readily available regional anesthesia techniques, which are more simple but equally effective, there is less and less need for the epidural. As Dr. Narinder Rawal has put it, he is a past president of ESRA, and he is also a card caller awardee. He posted this question in the RAPM journal, epidural technique for postoperative pain, gold standard no more, Based from a retrospective analysis from 2011 to 2017, which involves more than 4,000 patients, the following have been recorded as complications. They have been categorized into neurologic, drug-related, and cardiovascular side effects. Now, there are also litigation concerns, which are severe neurological complications like epidural hematoma, which has an incidence of 1 is to 26,000, and also subarachnoid hematoma, which has an incidence of 1 is to 775,000. Reports of fatal or critical complications have also been published, and there have been incidences of deaths. There have also been reports of field epidural, which is quite high, which ranges from 13% to 47%. And because of this reason, in conclusion, the advantages of the epidural is no longer as impressive as it was formerly believed. And the risks are greater than how it was estimated in the past. As Dr. Fuji has said, epidural analgesia can no longer be considered the standard of care for a general surgical population. The risk-benefit equation has shifted away from epidural in favor of the less invasive and equally effective regional anesthesia technique with less adverse effects, such that nerve blocks have brought a revolutionary change in outcomes. Now, these are the abdominal wall blocks, but for the purpose of this lecture, I will not talk anymore on the rectal sheet and ilu inguinal because with the first four blocks alone, there are already so many new updates. The transversus abdomen plain, or simply called top block, is a very popular block because it is a simple and effective analgesic technique. It relieves parietal pain. And according to Dr. Abdallah Do, different top block techniques have different analgesic effects. The very first top block that was introduced is the classical top, which is a landmark base. It was introduced by Rafi in 2001. And this is performed within the lumbar triangle of Petit, which is just posterior to the mid axillary line. It is bounded posteriorly by the latissimus dorsi, anteriorly by the external oblique, and inferiorly we have the iliac crest over here. Now the approach is done with the needle inserted perpendicular to the skin. And the first up that will be experienced, it means that the external oblique, the facial layer has been gone through. And the second pop would mean that you are already in the top plane, which is between the internal oblique and the transversus abdominis muscle. And this is where we inject the local anesthetic. But according to the cadaveric dissections that were performed by Yankovic and his group, the lumbar triangle of PT varies in angle, shape, and size, and that the distance from the mid axillary line to the center of the top ranges from 4 to 15 centimeters, which is quite further away from the previous studies that we have read. These variations would make identification of the lumbar triangle palpation by palpation a little bit tedious. So for the landmark approach, based on radiologic studies, the injectate can spread 
towards the costal margin and the mid-axillary line. It can also spread posteriorly towards the transversalis fascia, the quadratus lumborum, the psoas muscle, and towards the thoracic paravertebral face. It can then produce best visceral analgesia, and it can produce analgesia from P7 to L1, such that the pattern of cranial of spread is not only cranial, but there's also posterior spread. Now, the very first ultrasound guided top plaque that was introduced is the lateral or the mid axillary line approach, where the probe is positioned at the mid axillary line and place the needle at or near the anterior axillary line. And then you inject the local anesthetic at the top plate. Now, the pattern of spread of the injectate for this block is concentrated mainly in the mid axillary line and it can only reach as far as the anterior axillary line so that this block would only consistently block the T10 to T12 dermatomes, which is the lower plexus, such that the sensory loss is confined only to the intra umbilical area. It blocks the somatic type of pain, but it does not block the visceral pain and there's no distribution posteriorly towards the transversalis fascia or the psoas muscle, and there's no spread towards the thoracic paravertebral space. The T9 dermatomes are blocked less than 50% of the time because as my, I mentioned earlier, the T6 to T9 nerves would enter the top plane from the mid-clavicular line, while the L1 dermatomes would enter the top plane medial to the anterior superior iliac spine. So there is no way for this block to reach all of these nerves from T6 to T9 and the nerve from L1. Now, when the lateral tap was just being introduced before, I had a patient this big who weighed around 110 kilograms. And I know from the start, I will not be able to do an epidural on this patient. So what I did was to do a tap block together with multimodal analgesia. And there was a pain score of only one to two at the recovery room. The second top block technique is the subcostal block. It has been described as a means of providing analgesia of the supra umbilical region or the upper top plexus. It can block the T6 to T9 nerves and in relation to the entry of these nerves, we put our linear transducer adjacent and parallel to the subcostal margin. We then position our needle close to the siphoid process and insert the needle from median to lateral, placing the local anesthetic at the sheath between the rectus abdominis muscle and the transversus abdominis muscle. Now, the spread of the local anesthetic would vary because if you would inject the local anesthetic medial to the linea semilunaris, then you will be able to block the T6 to T8 nerves. But if you inject the local anesthetic lateral to the linea semilunaris, you'll be able to block the seven, the seven, I mean T9 and 11 nerves. But according to studies, it is indeed difficult to achieve in blocking the T6 and seven nerves, and it fails 50 to 70% of the time. Now, this does not block the lateral cutaneous branches. So there's no analgesia lateral to the anterior axillary line. In comparison for the subcostal approach, it is better suited for upper abdominal surgery, while the lateral or mid axillary approach is more appropriate for lower abdominal surgery. A variation of the subcostal tap called oblique subcostal tap was initially introduced by Dr. Hebbard of Australia. Now, what is done is that hydrodissection would be done from the um, siphoid process down to the anterior portion of the iliac crest for Dr. Yoshida. He did it at four injections so that you will be able to block the upper abdomen and the lower abdomen. So there is a wider analgesic coverage. The posterior type of the uh, the third type of technique is the posterior tap, where we place our transducer posterior to the mid axillary line. 
and just proximal to the iliac crest. Now, we look for the transversus abdominis and the other abdominal muscles where they will start tapering. And once the transversus abdominis would taper, it will form into an aponeurosis. And we would approach this plaque at the intersection between the top plane and the quadratus lumborum muscle, which is posterior media to the abdominal muscles. For this type of block, the local anesthetic would spread around the quadratus lumborum muscle, and there's also spread towards the P6 to P10 paravertebral spaces. There will also be a sympathetic blockade. Now, this type of approach is similar to the Rafis triangle of Petit, including the QL1, which was introduced by Blanco. We will discuss that later. Now, according to studies, the very first cesarean section was performed in Africa. And for top blocks, the technique that is most studied, the type of surgery is in cesarean cases. According to the study that was done by Tan and Islamian, they were able to conclude that the performance of the posterior or lateral cap would decrease opioid consumption including the vascular. But contrary to their findings, based from the study by Lone, McMorrow, and Costello, they were able to find out that the lateral tap is inferior to that of intrathecal morphine. They were able to conclude that tap block is associated with greater supplemental morphine requirements and higher pain scores than intrathecal morphine. It does not provide comparable analgesia, and it does not provide additional benefit when added to intrathecal morphine. Top block may be a reasonable alternative when intrathecal morphine is not used or when it is contraindicated. Sorry. Now, when it comes to laparoscopic cystectomy, cholecystectomy, which is the second most studied surgery for the use of TAP, studies have shown that was performed by Sheen and Oxer that lower vascores were recorded with the oblique subcostal TAP. Abdallah and his group tried to differentiate the analgesic efficacy between the posterior TAP and the lateral TAP and their findings showed that the dynamic pain is decreased up to the 48 hour for the posterior tap as compared for the lateral tap, which only lasts up to 24 hours. Now, when it comes to lessening the morphine consumption, the posterior tap lessened the consumption of morphine up to 48 hours as compared to lateral tap, wherein it only lasted for less than 12 hours. Since there is heterogeneity in the naming of blocks and the anatomical description of regional anesthesia techniques, a group of 62 experts from ASRA and ESRA, this includes Dr. Jeff Gudston, pulled together to form a consensus to standardize the nomenclature of the different types of regional anesthesia blocks. And I want to point out here the posterior top block and the lateral quadratus lumborum block. Now they tried to harmonize these two blocks together. And according to the consensus, most of them just named the posterior top as the lateral quadratus lumborum block. So from this time on, we would name the posterior top as QL1 or the lateral quadratus lumborum top block. The same uh, quadratus lumborum block. The same goes for the mid-axillary top block and the lateral top block. When they tried to harmonize the two techniques, the one that won in terms of unifying both of these blocks, and, um, I mean naming these blocks, instead of naming it as lateral top, we can just name it as mid-axillary top block. Dr. Tran initiated a summary of the recommendation of the type of block for the different types of surgery, like for example, for cesarean section. 
that posterior and lateral tap is not recommended if intrathecal opioids are used, while for laparoscopic cholecystectomy, subcostal approach is recommended, while for laparoscopic hysterectomy, laparoscopic appendectomy, and open prostatectomy, lateral tap is not recommended because there is marginal benefit. At the end, they recommended instead to perform the lateral quadratus lumborum block or the QL1 block. Now, the promise of a more extensive abdominal analgesia compared with the tap block accounts for the growing interest in the QL block where the quadratus lumborum muscle is the principal sonographic landmark. We perform this technique with the patient in the lateral or in the supine position. Before we go on, let us have a brief review of the thoracolumbar fascia, which consists of three layers. We have the anterior, which is anterior to the quadratus lumborum muscle, and in between the quadratus lumborum and the so, um, psoas major. Then we have the middle thoracolumbar fascia, which is posterior or dorsal to the quadratus lumborum muscle. And then we have the posterior layer, which is behind. I mean, the, the one behind the quadratus lumborum is the middle layer, and the posterior layer is the one behind the erector spinae and the uh, latissimus dorsi muscle. Now, the layers of the middle and the posterior will join together to form the lateral rack. And then this lateral rack will join together with the aponeurosis of the transversus abdominis and the internal oblique. The transversalis fascia, which envelopes the transversus abdominis muscle, would also envelope the anterior portion of the investing fascia of the QL muscle. Now, based from cadaveric dissections and studies, the transversalis fascia investing the QL muscle is continuous with the endothoracic fascia in the thorax. And it is suggested that this is the pathway for the cranial extension of the local anesthetic to spread towards the thoracic paravertebral space. The thoracal lumbar fascia is also continuous caudal with the fascia iliaca, and thus there is a consistent spread, not only proximally, but also caudal. Now for the QL1 technique, we have three techniques for the quadratus lumborum blocks. The local anesthetic is injected at the top plane that interacts with the anterior portion of the quadratus lumborum muscle. The needle is injected or directed from anterior to posterior, while for the QL2, the local anesthetic is injected posterior to the quadratus lumborum muscle. The needle is also directed from anterior to posterior. Now for the transmuscular quadratus lumborum block or the QL3, which was initially described by Jens Borglum from Denmark, the local anesthetic is injected at the margin of the quadratus lumborum at the anterior uh, thoracolumbar fascia just before the psoas major muscle. Now, this is also called the anterior or QL3. This is how I do the QL block. So after you have identified the muscles, you can see here the transverse process of L4. You can see here the QL muscle. Then we have the psoas muscle. We now have here the needle. It is now at the fascia between the QL and the psoas major muscle. And we are now injecting the local anesthetic. And you can see clearly well the spread of the local anesthetic at the fascia that separates the QL from the psoas major muscle. Now, recognition that thoracic paravertebral spread is essential has generated two new techniques that are inserted. The needle is inserted higher than the lumbar for vertebral process. Now, we have the transverse oblique approach where the patient is in a seated position 
And then in the same manner as you do your QL3, the um, curve transducer is positioned in a transverse way, but it is positioned at the L2, around three centimeters from the spinous process of L2. And in the same way, we inject the local anesthetic between the quadratus lumborum and the psoas muscle. These blocks are intended to further um, cause a higher dermatoma level for the reach of the local anesthetic or for the spread of the local anesthetic. The second approach is the paramedian sagittal oblique, where the patient is placed in a lateral decubitus position. The probe is directed cranially six to eight centimeters lateral to the spinous process of L1. And the muscle, the quadratus lumborum muscle is identified as it tapers near the um, rib 12 or the 12th rib. And in the same manner, the local anesthetic is injected between the quadratus lumborum at the sheath between the QL and the psoas muscle. <clears throat> Here are some several results of the injected spread among cadaveric studies. Based from the study of Dam, al Sharkawi, and Carney, their findings showed that there is indeed spread of the local anesthetic towards the thoracic paravertebral space. But contrary to their studies, based from the cadaveric dissections that were done by Sondekopam, Adhikari, and Kumar, their findings show that there is no spread towards the thoracic paravertebral space. Based from the study of Dr. Hadzik and his group, where they also, also tried to investigate if there's indeed a spread towards the thoracic paravertebral space, they tried to inject the local anesthetic among patients who underwent surgery, abdominal surgery, and they tried to allocate the three types of blocks among these patients. And their findings showed that for the QL1, there's no spread towards the thoracic paravertebral space. For the QL2, there was but one patient where there was spread to the thoracic paravertebral space. By the, but for the QL3, which is the transverse oblique paramedian, where they did it at the level of the L2, there was spread towards the lumbar paravertebral space, the lumbar nerve roots. There was an effect on the sympathetic chain, but again, there was only one patient where there was spread towards the paravertebral space. So according to Dr. Hadzik, more studies should be done because based from the previous knowledge that we knew of the previous studies that has been done, cadaveric studies, there is spread towards the paravertebral space. And their findings also show that when QL1 and QL2 blocks were done, the inject tape is mostly spread in the top plane, the fossil planes of the T10 and the T11 rib. Now, because of the uncertainty of the thoracic paravertebral spread, on the other hand, Based on the theory of Dr. Ackerman and the group of Dr. Gadsden, their assumption is that visceral analgesia results from the spread of anesthetics to the celiac ganglion or sympathetic trunk via splanchnic nerve. Now, a block of the celiac ganglion would cause a profound abdominal analgesia. This assumption can be confirmed by the study that was done by Dr. Saito where they injected a dye coming from the thoracic area, and then there was spread towards the arcuate ligament and the transversalis fascia, towards the celiac ganglion, and there was also spread towards the lesser and the greater splanchnic nerve, and even towards the psoas muscle. So meaning, just like the QL block, there is a spread of the local anesthetic to the transversalis fascia towards the celiac ganglion, which can cause the profound abdominal analgesia. Based from the study of Marucci, where they tried to compare the effect of UL from the top block in terms of analgesic duration and cutaneous sensory effect, their findings show that at the 24th hour 
there was still profound analgesia coming from the QL1, while for the lateral tap, the analgesia only lasted for less than 12 hours. But when it comes to the dermatomal effect, QL1 reached as far as T7 in comparison to the lateral tap, which only reached as far as T10. Now we go next to erector spiny. Ever since it was introduced, initially there were lots of studies in the thoracic region for thoracic surgery, but with its emergence, several studies have also been done for abdominal surgeons. And these studies have shown that indeed, erector spiny pain block can decrease vascular and morphine consumption. Now, Dr. Ki Jin, one of the proponents of the erector spiny block, performed a pilot study among four patients undergoing the paroscopic ventral urinary repair, where they injected 20 to 30 cc of rutibacane, 0.5%, which is injected at a T7. Their findings showed that 24 hour pain score was only 2.5 to 3.5. Now, they also obtained a radiologic study and tried to see the spread of the injectate. Their findings showed that on the right side, the craniocaudal that spread was between T2 to L3, while on the left side was between C5 and L2. Now, what about the paravertebral block? Does it have any effect in abdominal analgesia? And how can we compare it with the epidural? Now, based from the systematic review that was done by Bogdali et al., the single shot thoracic paravertebral block provides post op analgesia in 12 to 24 hours. It reduced the pain scores and the opioid consumption compared to systemic analgesia and the top. But there was a block failure rate of less than 3%, but the complications are uncommon. Three studies compared thoracic paravertebral block to the epidural, and these three studies have different results. The first study showed that the thoracic paravertebral block is inferior to the epidural. For the second study, there was no difference in terms of morphine requirements or vascor. For the third study, it showed that the thoracic paravertebral block is superior to the epidural. Their conclusion was that thoracic paravertebral block has a potential as an alternative RA technique, particularly where both somatic and visceral analgesia is required. Now, based from these two studies, according to Hodgkin's, where they also compared the paravertebral with the epidural among 53 patients, there was no significant difference in pain scores in total opioid requirements. There was also no difference in hospital length of stay, but the epidural increased the risk of modality-related adverse effects. Now, based from the study of Sundekupam, where he did this study among 70 patients, their findings showed that the pain scores were within clinically acceptable limits, but the study state venous level was higher than an acceptable threshold in nine of 34 cases for paravertebral block, but they never had any incidences of loss. In summary, at the present time, with the reasons that I have mentioned and the readily available regional anesthesia techniques that are more simple but as effective as epidural, there's now less and less need for the epidural. The oblique subcostal tap is effective for laparoscopic polycystectomy. Posterior tap is harmonized to lateral QL. And for the QL blocks, there is insufficient evidence to recommend which approach to select over another. ESP can be used as the first line analgesia as part of multimodal analgesia. And the thoracic paravertebral block has a potential as an alternative of RA technique. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it is a very nice and detailed talk about the abdominal analgesia. It's nice to hear you, Dr. Uh, 
I believe we have a few questions uh, waiting for you in the Q&A box. And we're going to do a few <clears throat> live questions. Uh, I have actually uh, gathered around a few panelists for the tr three of you. Uh, we have Dr. Fian Bodo from Indonesia and Manoj is here with us uh, and he, he's going to talk about he is going to ask a few questions, I think. But before that, uh, there are one of the panelists from Indonesia who would like to ask uh, first for Dr. Uh, Shariat. Uh, this guy is a, the, the, Dr. Rongo is a cardiac anesthesiologist slash general anesthesiologist. And his question is, we used to perform uh, PIFB. Uh, that's the uh, for the cardiac surgery. We usually we do three injections each side for improving success rate for cabbage surgery and valve procedure. The fentanyl intraoperative was five micrograms per body weight, and and they use oxycodone uh, 0.5 milligram per hour for 24 hour extubation. Extubation within six hours of less. Uh, is there any suggestions to improve the outcome? For Dr. Sharia, uh, <clears throat> I, I I I would would say uh, it, it's an excellent method. Uh, I think that initial reports talked about several injections for the PIF block. We, in our experience, and I I, I don't say that this is necessarily correct. We found that one injection uh, is sufficient for spread uh, throughout the, the space and, and generally gets at least up till T2. The T1 level occasionally is missed. Uh, possibly uh, that also has to do with the fact that lower cervical dermatomes are innervating the upper part of the, uh, of the sternum and those are, those are missed. But in general, uh, we, we use the one injection uh, method per side. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Shara. And the second question is for Penn. Uh, in gynecology laparoscopy, we perform lateral tap block uh, prior to incision. And the technique reduced the intraoperative need for opioids and showed no need for opioid postoperatively. Do you have any suggestions regards why is it not recommended doing lateral tap block in laparoscopy gynecology? Uh, and um, so <laughs> it's around three questions. <laughs> anyway, based from studies for cesarean section, they do not recommend that they do not recommend anymore the lateral or the posterior tap. Actually the posterior tap is now called QL1. Um, they would rather just use plain and simple morphine because they saw that the effect of morphine is even superior as compared to performing a lateral tap. Now, you would only do the tap or the QL1 if you did not use morphine. So um, those are the findings. Now, what is the other question, Mona? I, I think uh, from the Q&A box, there's... <clears throat> What, which approach do you recommend for L block for obese patients? <laughs> so for obese, maybe it would be easier to just do a lateral QL, QL1, because if you do an anterior approach, which is the QL3, then it will be a little bit deeper. But if you do a QL1, then it will be more superficial. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ben. <laughs> And uh, yeah, I've been doing a lot of PL lately, but my personal favorites lately because I'm doing a lot of uh, retro uh, peritoneal laparoscopy is using the subcostal uh, posterior uh, from the posterior from the back uh, because the incision port, uh, if you're using the, lat the, the intramuscular uh, from the lateral, uh, <clears throat> it will not cover the the, in the port because it is uh, uh, inserted way in the back. So I don't, so we, we're not doing it 
for that. And we're doing studies for it. And Dr. Gaston, I have a personal questions for you uh, concerning the ESP. Uh, yes, I've been, uh, I, I told you my condition that uh, most of our cases were, uh, we, we did on kidney transplant surgery, but that uh, intraoperatively we see no fluctuation of the hemodynamics that, uh, that make me assume that it is probably because of the high dose of local anesthetic used uh, absorbed into the intravenous uh, and, and afterwards, uh, postoperatively, even though the hemodynamics said that it is not painful because the heart uh, rate and the blood pressure is very steady, but the patient still complains of pain. So, and uh, in that case, I'm doing it for in the T9 or T10. And this is a transition between the ESP for the thoracal and the lumbar area. Do you have any opinions on that? Or rather, I just do the both lumbar and thoracal. Um, well, Mono, thanks for your question. We see the same thing. We see patients wake up from surgery and they seem to have done well throughout the anesthetic in terms of the requirement. And then um, they have some amount of pain, but, um, but, but less pain than you'd expect. And I, I think, again, we don't have answers to this. And this is one of the, one of the big mysteries of the ESP. Personally, I suspect there's a sympathetic block going on that helps make that a smooth ride through the anesthetic and then prevent, provide some degree of sympathetically mediated pain relief. Um, but we don't, we don't have rigorous data to support that theory at the moment. Um, I think that uh, for most cases, unless you have a really extensive scoliosis yeah. case, for those cases, we'll do one, two, three, four injections. Uh -huh. But for most other indications, we find that it spreads enough that you can do a single injection at the midpoint of where you're looking for and, and get decent results. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and next, we, Dr. P, do you have any questions for three of the speakers? Hi, Dr. P. Hi, good morning to you. <laughs> Hope, uh, morning. you are all in uh, good health and please stay safe. Glad to see you all again. <laughs> I have one question to uh, all the, the panelists and the uh, speakers. We have seen all the outcomes comparing the interfacial blocks for thoracic or abdominal wall and comparing with the epidural, but which uh, outcome is the most important for you, according to your opinion? Is it the pain score or the reducing of uh, morphine uh, opioid consumption or else? Which outcome is, uh, is very important? Okay. Uh, Who's going to start uh, first? Dr. I, I can jump in if you want first. I, I think that pain scores are really challenging to interpret after block studies. Everyone, you know, it's so subjective. And I think a more meaningful uh, measure of someone's comfort is uh, how much pain medicine are they taking to get them to that three out of 10 or the two out of 10, whatever it is. So I, I do like opioid consumption or, or energy consumption, I should say that as a as, an, as a gross outcome measure of comfort. I do think, and I, I wonder if Dr. Karmakar will agree with me that a, a quality of recovery index is becoming a more um, attractive outcome to measure because that's just a really functional thing. And you know, patients are gonna have some pain after surgery, but does your block afford them the opportunity to go home sooner, to do their activities of daily living sooner, to to um, to drive, to walk, and those sorts of things. Um, so I, I'm a fan of patient reported outcomes. Do you have any quantitative uh, measurement for that? Uh, the one that you favors the most in the quality uh, of recovery? Yeah, there, there are. There's a bunch of them. Um, yeah. The QR QR15 is an easy one. Um, it's the problem. The difficulty becomes if you end up making these things 
you know, bigger and bigger and bigger, it becomes an impediment to, to actually asking the questions and getting, getting the data. So something that's in the, in the range of, um, you know, can you do this questionnaire and, and collect the data in a couple of minutes? several times throughout the course of the recovery is, is um, useful. Uh, hi, you? You? Oh, Manoj, do you have any? Oh, hello, everybody. <laughs> Salam <Hi>. to you <laughs> all. <laughs> Salam. Uh, Good morning. I'm just having a very lazy Saturday morning here. So <laughs> uh, that was a great session, uh, Jeff, Penn, and Ali. Uh, to answer uh, Pri's question, I think I concur with uh, Jeff, that uh, a more holistic outcome should be looked at rather than just uh, a very um, narrowed look at pain relief or just uh, opioid consumption. So I think quality of recovery is becoming more popular, uh, particularly in this era of eras where we are looking at overall outcome of patients, then uh, our quality of recovery score uh, that is patient-centered is, is more meaningful outcome that we should all be centering. Because if you are really giving your patient intention to treat, then you shouldn't see a difference in opioid consumption uh, or different, sorry, difference in uh, pain relief because the pain outcome should be good unless one is uh, biased to the other. So uh, I think, uh, how does patient feel? And uh, many studies have shown that really patients don't bother about the pain. They are more worried about, can they move around in the bed? Can they mobilize out of bed? Can they go to the toilet? And these are some questions that are all incorporated into the quality of recovery that is uh, you know, patient-based uh, uh, response. And I think it makes more sense to use these. And there are a bunch of these uh, criterias all been validated in, in, in perioperative scenarios. So I think everyone should be encouraged to adopt them in their starting from the pre-operative and into the, into the PACU and post-op period. Also, I have a question for, for Jeff. Um, you know, the ESP, although it is uh, a kind of a, a elusive blog that uh, you have written in your editorial too, but uh, are they, are, do you have any concerns of using them in uh, scoliotic surgery? Because um, there is potential to produce epidural blockade, to produce neuroaxial blockade. And when you are using relatively large volumes, uh, then um, uh, you know, it may interfere with somatosensory monitoring and, and so on and so forth. So I think uh, there is not much um, debate about this in, in the literature. But I think it is becoming more a concern when the surgeon and the anesthesiologist now confronted with this procedure uh, and they are worried about it. What are your thoughts on this to the panelists, if I may? Yeah, thanks, thanks Mosh. Um, that's a great question. And, I, and something that we were concerned about when we first started doing this for, for spine surgery, it, are we gonna completely disrupt the neuromonitoring ability or, get spread into the epidural space and the patient wakes up with numb legs on both sides. The, um, the cadaveric evidence was supportive and helpful and reassuring that we wouldn't do that with an ESP block. And so far for, for um, you know, straightforward adult lumbar and low thoracic spine surgeries, our experience has been um, that it hasn't, hasn't been a problem. The monitoring seems to be those those neural pathways seems to be seem to be intact, uh, despite putting thirty mils of local anesthetic on both sides. I think your 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 question is a good one related to extensive deformity cases um, because our volumes are bigger and and the deformity might in and of itself cause um, a sort of a weird pattern of spread into the into those spaces. I'm we haven't done a whole lot in in scoliosis we're just starting to get involved with that so i don't i don't have any personal answers for you and i'm unaware of any data showing that that it's uh that interferes or causes a problem but it's a good thought yeah i think uh if i may just add a little to that now uh, 
if you if you look at the recent literature and we have we have some work uh, on review at this moment uh, the elusiveness of ESP is now going to probably be unraveled because uh, the Korean group have defined the retro SETL space. Now, for those of you who uh, are familiar with the ESP anatomy must bear in mind that the ESP plane communicates with this retro SETL space, which is behind the superior costal transverse ligament anteriorly. Laterally, it communicates with the intercostal space and medially it can communicate with the paravertebral and the epidural space. So when you inject into the uh, ESP, if relatively large volume and for some reason, uh, if there are preferential spreads, then it is possible that you may get quite significant epidural spread. Now, what dictates that we don't know at this current moment, but uh, there is a potential pathway because eventually, if you look at the anatomy in the, in the, in the, of the muscles and the ligaments, the intramuscular planes are usually uh, fascia and fat. And these are all interladen, intercommunicating. Eventually it leads, it leads into the neuraxis. So if you inject a really large volume of local, it can get to the, uh, to the um, epidural space. But do bear in mind that the amount of epidural spread is a small fraction of what you inject. So uh, this probably explains some of the um, variability in experience of different authors. Some have reported this, some have reported that. So I think um, a more targeted injection into the retro SETL space is desirable. So we have described a retro SETL space injection uh, and hopefully um, uh, it would be a more targeted injection for the various applications. So uh, I think only time will tell where we go from here. So this yeah. is just something in the horizon. Uh, Manoj, yeah, cool. if, if you said the spreading is, uh, it, the working of this block is by the spreading of local anesthetic and get into the epidural space, why don't we just do the epidural block? Uh, you have a you have a good uh, question there, Pri. Um, I think uh, in this day of uh, eras and where we are trying to minimize motor effects and mm -hmm. and the other things that uh, Penn alluded to, I think a more um, peripheral approach is is desirable. But now you see we are using e we are using ESP, we are using uh, many other techniques, uh, using relatively large volumes of local anesthetics. And uh, although the mechanisms are still, uh, you know, elusive in some respect, yeah. but at the end of the day, you have to produce a somatic and sympathetic blockade to provide the clinical efficacy. And uh, whichever way it produces this uh, is, uh, is still uh, debatable. So, but I think this, uh, in this data that came at uh, this cadaver and the micro CT anatomy data that came out from, uh, from Korea, uh, is truly, um, in my opinion, it truly um, clarifies many of the, the of the uncertainties that we had about the communication between the neuraxis, the paravertebral space, and the intermuscular plane behind uh, the transverse processes. So they are all interconnected. Uh, to me, uh, I understand it very well. It is uh, uh, it is going to be something that. Uh, uh, we will probably be focusing more in the near future. There's still, there's still many things that we don't know. But yes, we, we, we're trying to do it uh, porcine modeling, probably, right? Uh, and see where the, where the, the local anesthetic, because uh, using cadaveric, as the literature might say, the, they don't have the dynamic. Uh, yeah. Those challenges that Martha has said, that, that's the big question that we have to answer through the many studies. But also we have to study our deficit, our epidural block, I think. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And lastly, Dr. Shariat, I would like some personal questions uh, concerning the regional anesthesia of the facial plane block for cardiac surgery. I know 
uh, cardiac surgery can be uh, very variable. Uh, some uh, goes uh, straight activated and observed in the ICU, and most of the cases, uh, probably not the so good cases, would end up in the ICU uh, with uh, days of intubation in the ventilator. What would your recommendation of a facial plain block? Uh, did you do a second block or would you put a catheter on it or to increase the duration of the block or at least by doing just one single shot at the at after uh, induction would be beneficial enough for the patient? So we, we don't have a lot of experience using the catheters. Certainly, they have been described, for example, for the parasternal blocks, uh, the use of catheters in case reports. I would not recommend that technique uh, due to the fact that these, these catheters are in such close proximity to the wound that uh, either uh, bacterial, you know, some sort of contamination can cause an infection, or if an infection occurs, the the uh, catheters will be blamed. Uh, we have not done rectospiny catheters either. Uh, I, I think that we're we're still figuring out how well they work uh, before we we give these patients indwelling catheters. Also. We have to, to keep in mind that for most patients, uh, you know, once they're extubated, they have to get out of bed. And having catheters attached to their backs, uh, which have to be managed uh, by, by the ICU nurses who, who have never seen such a, such a technique, that'll, that'll complicate matters. So we haven't gotten into those techniques. We have, though, on occasion used Xforel uh, for these fascial plane blocks. Uh, you know, anecdotally, I could say that we have had good success, uh, but we have not done enough uh, to, to make uh, real generalizations about that technique. Okay, thank you, Shara. And we're going to see the Q&A box, Let's see if there's, I think, uh, okay. Uh, okay, Dr. Penn, uh, uh, and most of our panelists, uh, do, uh, do you have any concerns about the, safety using high dose of local anesthetics during interfacial plane. Uh, do you have any opinions of the last? Uh, I don't think there, I don't, I don't see a lot of reports, but uh, should we be worried enough uh, of last or how do we prevent them? I think, uh, can you answer that, Pan? Yeah, for, for example, for the QL block, mm -hmm. We know um, Filipinos or even Asians in general, we usually weigh less than our European or American countries, but we always stick to the golden rule, like we would not go beyond, we always compute it to the traditional method of, um, for like bupivacaine, for example, the toxic dose is three cc per kilogram. And when we do our bilateral QL block, we would only place 20 cc of 0.25% of bupivacaine from each side. So for both sides, we will have 40 cc, which is only around 100 milligrams. So if the patient weighs 50 kilos, so it's way beyond the, the toxic dose, which is three milligrams per kilo, which would be 150 milligrams. So at sometimes even we would place as far as 0.375% if you would want to have a longer duration of analgesia, and we would also add dexamethasone to prolong the effect of the analgesia, but we 
these techniques that we are doing 0.375, 0.25% on VR within that range. Na no last at all uh, has happened. And sometimes if we use, for example, 0.375, you would add some epinephrine to delay further the absorption. So th that's how we do it. Yes, thank you, man. And yes, <laughs> Dr. Cecilio has already signaled me. <laughs> okay, <laughs> kill the switch. Okay, we had a great talk this morning. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sharia, Dr. Gatsis, and Ben, my dear friend. And thank you so much for the impromptu uh, panelists, uh, Manoj and Dr. Pri. Uh, it is actually a great session. We'll be seeing a lot of uh, ESP uh, paper coming up uh, describing how they would actually work and we would also uh, like to see how well does uh, facial plane block for cardiac surgery and of course uh, for abdominal surgery we're starting to replace epidural uh, analgesia with a facial plane uh, block for abdominal surgery and uh, I'm Mono. Uh, I would like to thank everybody uh, for attending this meeting. We have a uh, six more hundred and forty, uh, six hundred and thirty <laughs> participant participant joining us this morning. It is a one great achievement. So thank you so much, guys. You would uh, wake up so early <laughs> in the morning <laughs> and. <laughs> And uh, thank you all for your attention. Uh, and I will give the drone back to Trisha. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Mono, for moderating such a wonderful session. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Pan. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Manoj. Thank you, all. Don't forget Manoj and Ali, 12 o'clock. <laughs> you see, time for you, for both of you. Midnight. <laughs> Midnight. Midnight for them. <laughs> it is eight o'clock actually. <laughs> All right, okay. great session, guys. Uh, it's a great opening session on Saturday morning. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of good discussions. Uh, again, like what the Termono said, I hope we can see each other again next year. Hopefully, next year we will be doing an offline meeting, finger cross. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, that wraps up the first session of the day. Uh, thank you so much, and we'll see you at the next session. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Much. Thank you.